In this video, we're going to apply the conservation of mechanical energy to find the velocity of an object after it falls a total distance of 5 meters from its starting point. Now the first thing we want to do is identify our coordinate system. So the up direction is going to be the positive y direction. And it's customary to label the ground as y equals 0 meters. That is, the ground is going to be the origin of our coordinate system. And that would mean that this point up here would be y equals 10 meters indicating that this point right here is 10 meters above the ground. And let's just give this point a name instead of just constantly saying that it's 10 meters above the ground. Let's label this as point A, and we'll label this as height YA. Now let's say that the mass of the rock is equal to 10 kilograms. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to identify the total mechanical energy that this rock has here if it's above the ground motionless. So in this case, we'll call this the total mechanical energy, abbreviated with a capital E. And we'll put a subscript to indicate that it's the total mechanical energy at point A. And that's going to equal the total kinetic energy that this object has plus the total gravitational potential energy that this rock has while it's 10 meters above the Earth's surface. Now if we assume that this rock is sitting here motionless, ready to fall, then it has zero kinetic energy. The reason it has zero kinetic energy is because it's motionless. Only objects that are in motion have kinetic energy as equal to the total gravitational potential energy that this rock has at this point right here. Now you know that the total gravitational potential energy an object has is equal to the object's mass times the gravitational acceleration here on Earth times the total distance that this object can fall. Now in theory, this object can fall a total distance of 10 meters at this point. So this rock has a total gravitational potential energy equal to the mass of the rock, which we said was 10 kilograms, times the gravitational acceleration here on Earth, which is 9.8 meters per second per second, times the total distance it could potentially fall, which in this case is 10 meters. Now when you multiply these numbers out, 10 times 9.8 times 10, you'll get 980 in a kilogram times a meter per second squared times a meter works out to be a unit of energy, which is a unit of a joule. So this rock, by virtue of its height above the Earth's surface, has a total potential energy of 980 joules. Now I'd like to just make an important side note. Now we said that the rock has a total energy of 980 joules. And it's useful to know the energy because we can use this value to calculate how much energy this object can transfer to another object if we were to release it and allow it to fall. Now we make use of gravitational potential energy every single day whether we know it or not. And that's in the use of hydroelectric power plants which store large volumes of water high above the Earth's surface. Now a large volume of water has a lot of mass. And when that mass is allowed to fall through a channel, in this case a conduit, that gravitational potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy. And then that water can push on a turbine located at the base of the conduit, which then converts that stored gravitational potential energy into electric energy or into an electric current. So this is how gravitational potential energy is used in everyday life. Now going back to the problem that we started with, we said that this rock has 980 joules of energy due to its position above the Earth's surface. And now what we want to do is we want to find out what the velocity of this rock is when it falls half of the distance. So in this case, half of the distance would be a distance of 5 meters. So we want to find the velocity of this rock after it falls 5 meters. And I'm going to label this point point B. So what we need to do is we need to find the total mechanical energy at this point right here. And to do that, the total mechanical energy at point B is going to equal the sum of its kinetic energy, so the kinetic energy at point B, plus the potential energy at point B. Now in this case, we can't say that the kinetic energy at point B is zero because this object is falling, therefore its velocity is increasing. But we can calculate the object's potential energy at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as one half the mass of the rock times the velocity of the rock squared. And I'm going to label this as the velocity of the rock at point B plus this object's total gravitational potential energy, which is the mass of the rock times the gravitational acceleration of the rock times the distance that that rock can fall at that point, which I'll label as point B. Now in this case, I'm just going to leave this term alone because I know it's going to equal one half the mass times the velocity of the rock at point B squared, but I can find out the gravitational potential energy at that point, and in this case, this is going to be 10 kilograms times the gravitational acceleration here on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared, times the distance that that rock can continue to fall, which at that point, the rock is only 5 meters above the ground, so it can only fall a distance of 5 meters. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rewrite this term as 1 half the mass of the rock times the velocity of the rock squared, plus I can now calculate this number. So in this case, 10 times 9.8 times 5 works out to be 490 joules. A kilogram times a meter per second squared times a meter is a unit of a joule. And it's at this point that I can now 
utilize the conservation of mechanical energy, which says that the total mechanical energy at point A has to equal the total mechanical energy at point B. Now we calculated the total mechanical energy at point A to be 980 joules. And when that's going to equal the total mechanical energy at point B, which is this value right here. So what we're going to do is substitute this value for the energy at point B, which in this case will work out to be one half the mass times the velocity of the rock squared plus, in this case, 490 joules. So this rock at this point has 490 joules of energy. Now I know the mass of the rock, but I don't know what the velocity of the rock is at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify this equation. So I know that 980 joules has to add up to be whatever this term is plus this 490 joules. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 490 joules from both sides, which you do to one side of an equation, you do to the other side. And 980 joules minus 490 joules works out to be 490 joules. And I'm going to set that equal to this term right here, which is 1 half the mass of the rock times the velocity of the rock at point B squared. Now since I'm looking for the velocity of the rock, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for the velocity of the rock. To do that, I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by 2. What you do to one side of the equation, you do to the other. So you get 900 and 80 joules equals the mass of the rock times the velocity of the rock squared. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by the mass of the rock. What you do to one side of an equation, you do to the other. And in this case, you get 980 joules divided by the mass of the rock, which we said was 10 kilograms. And 980 divided by 10 works out to be 98. And a joule divided by a kilogram works out to be a meter squared per second squared. And that's going to equal the velocity of the rock at point B squared. Now the next step we need to do is we need to take the square root of both sides of this equation to find the velocity of the rock. So in this case we have the velocity of the rock squared and that's going to equal 98 meters squared per second squared. So what we need to do is take the square root of both sides. What you do to one side of an equation, you do to the other. And when I do that, I get that the velocity of the rock at point B equals plus or minus the square root of 98 works out to be 9.9 .9, and the square root of a meter squared per second squared works out to be a meter per second. So the velocity of this rock is plus or minus 9.8 meters per second. Now what you need to do is take into account the direction in which the rock is traveling. The rock is traveling in the downward direction. So the velocity of the rock at point B is going to be negative 9.9 .9 meters per second. And the negative is because it's traveling in the negative y direction. And so this is going to be the velocity of the rock at point B. Now let's just summarize what happened during this problem. So what happened is, this rock had all potential energy at this point, but as we released it and allowed it to fall, the force of gravity accelerated this rock in the downward direction, speeding the rock up. So what we're seeing is that the potential energy that this rock has at the very top is getting converted into both kinetic and potential energy as it falls. Now the potential energy starts to decrease as the rock gets closer and closer to the ground. Meanwhile, the kinetic energy of the rock increases. Now the last thing I'm going to do before ending this video is just make the energy diagrams for the total mechanical energy at this point at the very top. So in this case, we said that the total mechanical energy of the rock at the very top was equal to 980 joules. So what I'm going to do, when I look at the mechanical energy on our energy diagram at this point, I'm going to fill in up until 980 joules. And in this case, I'm just rounding this up to 1,000 joules. And the other thing that you should see is that the total energy at the very top before we let this rock go was also equal to 980 joules. So on our energy diagram, we can fill in the potential energy bar. Now the other thing we said is the total kinetic energy that this rock has before we release it is zero. So when you add up the kinetic and the potential energy terms, they're going to add up to be the total mechanical energy. And one of the things that you should see is the area filled in on this side of the energy graph is equal to the area filled in on this side of the energy graph. Now this one case is not very interesting. So let's take a look at the energy diagram when this rock falls half the distance. Now according to the conservation of mechanical energy, the total mechanical energy at any point along this object's path as it falls is going to equal the total energy at the very top. So in this case, this object has a total mechanical energy equal to 980 joules. We then calculated the total potential energy the rock had when it had fallen 5 meters, and that worked out to be 490 joules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in 490 joules worth of energy on the potential energy graph. Now one of the things that we could go back and do is figure out the total kinetic energy that this object had by plugging in the value of the object's velocity that we found. But we actually don't need to do that because we already figured out down here 
that this rock had a total kinetic energy of 490 joules. So we can go back to our energy diagram and we can fill in the total kinetic energy that this rock had after it had fallen 5 meters worked out to be 490 joules. And now what you should see is when you add up the area in the kinetic energy bar graph with the total potential energy in the bar graph, that total area is going to add up to be the same mechanical energy.